Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Core. Lately I've been reviewing a lot of expensive handhelds at just that time of the year. And honestly, I love playing around with the cheaper stuff, you know, the things that you can find for under 100 bucks. And so today we're going to do a bit of a palette cleanser and try a really cheap one. This one here is called the M17 and it retails for about 55 bucks. Now at this price point, I don't have a lot of high expectations, but I always love just kind of playing around with them and figuring out what the best use case is going to be for each of these little handhelds. And it took me a while to figure out where the M17 really shines, but I think I figured it out. And that is, I think it's going to be a really good handheld that you could give to a child. And there's quite a few reasons for it, but number one is that it's super sturdy and very easy to navigate. And so that's the assumption I'm going to make when you're jumping into this video here, is that you're looking for something that's kind of cheap that you can hand off to somebody else. And I think you'll find when all is said and done that this might be a pretty good choice in that regard. Either way, I think we're going to have a lot of fun in this video. So without any further delay, let's go ahead and jump in. Okay, to start, this is a review unit that was sent over to me from KeepRetro.com. As always, all opinions are my own and no money was exchanged in any way. And like I mentioned in the intro, this costs about $55 and it does come with free shipping here on their website. And I'll leave it all linked down below in case you want to check it out. Now there are a few things I want to bring up about the specs. Number one, let's talk about the screen. So this is 4.3 inches with a resolution of 480 by 272. It's exactly the same as the original PSP. And this is very close to a 16 by 9 aspect ratio as well. Now the CPU here is an RK3126, so it's not the most powerful in the world, but it's still pretty decent for this price point. Although there are a couple specs that aren't the greatest. For example, the memory is only 256 megabytes, and they only have a 1500 milliamp hour battery that'll only give you about two or three hours of gameplay, depending on what you're playing. And finally, the last thing to note is that the operating system is Linux-based. They're actually running a version of Emulec version 4.3. Anyway, let's go ahead and jump into the unboxing, and if you want to see any of the other specs, they're also on the back of the box. Anyway, inside of the box, we don't have a lot going on, obviously the device itself, and we have a very basic instruction manual, and then also a USB-C charging cable. Now, first impressions of the device itself, it reminds me a lot of a smaller and more compact Nintendo Switch Lite. The button layout is the same, and they even have these stacked shoulders and triggers like you would find on that device. Anyway, as you can see, it has a pretty bare bones design, but I kind of like that. That's part of its charm for me. Let's go ahead and start with talking about the I.O. with the top. On the left, we have a USB-C charging port and then a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. This also has a micro SD card slot, which will come with a 64 gigabyte card by default. And it's branded Lexar, but who knows if it's fake or not. And finally, up top, we have an on and off toggle. I think this is one of the reasons why it'll work out well for kids. We'll talk more about that later. Next, let's talk about the shoulder and trigger buttons. Now, the shoulder buttons themselves are a little bit thin, but they're easy to press down on. And same thing with these triggers. They have a little bit of a clickiness to them, but they're not super loud. In fact, these are quite a bit more comfortable than some other handhelds you'll find on the market that are much more expensive. Overall, I don't really have any complaints about the shoulders and triggers, and you can tell that they are definitely modeled after a Nintendo Switch Joy-Con or the Switch Lite. If anything, I would say it's a little ironic that we have such nice triggers here because very few systems will make use of them on this device. Next, we'll take off the screen protector and see how the front looks. Never mind, let's go ahead and try it again, and now we can actually look at the front of this device. Right off the bat, I think it has a very clean design other than that M17 logo on the bottom right. So let's go ahead and take a look at the controls, starting with the analog sticks. Now this has one of those small Joy-Con style analog sticks, so really no surprises here in terms of design. One thing of note is they do not click down L3 or R3, so in that regard, they're kind of modeled after something like the original Retroid Pocket 2. Either way, at this price point, I think they're going to be just fine. Next, let's go ahead and take a look at that D-pad. This has a rubber membrane connection and actually feels pretty decent, not too mushy and a little bit stiff. My only main complaint about it is that the D-pad itself just feels a little bit thin. But overall, I would say it has a pretty classic feel to it. The only other main complaint I would have is just the positioning of the D-pad itself in the fact that it's below the analog stick and it can get a little bit crampy if you have larger hands. Anyway, below that we have our select button on the left and the start button on the right. And then up top with the minus and plus buttons, these are actually the volume buttons. So these are not select and start like you would expect with a Nintendo Switch. Next, let's take a look at the face buttons. These also have a rubber membrane connection and actually have a really nice feel to them. 
Of all the controls on this device, I think these are probably the most ideal. And again, like with the trigger buttons, these are better buttons than I found on devices that cost twice as much as this one. So I'm actually very impressed with the feel of the face buttons here, very classic and retro. And to be honest, the overall shape and size of this device is pretty darn comfortable. It's rounded in all the right parts, I have plenty of space for all of my fingers. And really, other than the D-pad being down below, I have no notes when it comes to ergonomics. Now, like I mentioned before, it's a pretty bare bones device, so there is no I.O along the sides or the bottom of the device, and there's not a lot going on on the back either. However, you can see that there are some holes for one single mono speaker on this one side. And of course, we'll test that here in a bit. For now, let's go ahead and start up the device and see what we're working with. And like I mentioned in the intro, I think this is going to be a pretty good device for kids. And one of the main reasons for that is the physical on and off toggle. So many other handheld devices require you to go into these settings and then find the quit menu and then power it down that way. After all, these handhelds are basically like computers, so you have to shut them down in that regard. So for me, it's pretty refreshing when we have a physical toggle like this. I think it'll be really good for kids who don't want to navigate through a menu. Either way, when you start it up, you'll see the Emuelec logo and then we'll be right into our game system. And the setup here is pretty simple. You would just navigate through all the various systems, choose your game, and then boot it up from there. Now, before we get to that, I do have a couple notes. The first thing is that this is not an OCA laminated LCD panel. It's kind of rare when we find something that's not laminated nowadays, but essentially what that means is there'll be a gap between the glass on the front and then the panel itself down below. And this will affect things like the vibrancy of the colors as well as the viewing angles. Also, one thing of note is you may see some flickering in the footage right here, and that is something that I didn't actually see with the naked eye. But if you are susceptible to that kind of flickering, then this may not be the panel for you. Either way, Okay, let's start talking about the games. So this comes with that 64 gigabyte card preloaded, and there are quite a few games on here. In fact, I would argue there are too many games on here overall. A good example is going to be NES. There's about 700 or so games within the US catalog, but here you can see in our listing we have nearly 4,000 games listed. And that doesn't even include an additional section within the game menu for what they're calling NES hacks. There are a ton of duplicates within the file system. Luckily, this is a pretty easy fix, and I'll show you how to do that later. But if you are looking for a plug and play experience, I do think there will be a little bit of tweaking you'll have to do on your end just to make this a little bit more navigable. Anyway, with all that in mind, let's go ahead and boot up a couple games just to see what the pre-configuration is going to be like. So here I am picking one of the many Castlevania 3 options that we have, and we'll get a quick loading screen and then the game will boot right up. Now as we get into the game, there's a couple things worth mentioning. Number one is the game is stretched all the way to full screen or 16x9. Given the fact that NES was originally a 4x3 system, this does look a little bit stretched. And even though this handheld is using RetroArch for most of its emulation background, I tried as hard as I could to find the RetroArch quick menu and unfortunately I couldn't find a hotkey combination that would actually work. So unfortunately, as it stands right now, I was not able to go into the settings and reconfigure the aspect ratio. Instead, I did find that there is its own version of a quick menu by pressing select and start. And this is pretty bare bones, which again would probably work out pretty well for children. You have the option of saving and loading a state or then just quitting the game. So obviously it's a very simple menu interface, but it'll probably get the job done. I'd love to be able to get into the quick menu and make more changes, but that's what we have to work with at least right now. While we're here, let's go ahead and do a quick audio test so you can get a feel for what that mono speaker is going to sound like. And for the price point, I don't think that is terrible. I think the sound is actually nice and crisp. My only detractors here is that it's in mono and then also that it's backfiring. So depending on how you hold your hands, it might be a little bit muffled sounding. Now, another thing I wanted to test is what kind of main menu settings that we had to work with. By pressing start, we can see we get the Emulec menu, but this is very bare bones. We've only got three options. The first one is to change the screen brightness, or as they call it within the settings, the Bacac light. And we have a pretty good dynamic range here between the very lowest setting and the brightest. Anyway, we also have system settings, but unfortunately within here, there's not much going on. And they also have something like 30 different languages that you can choose from from these bare bones settings. Next, I want to do a couple tests with the D-pad just to kind of see what we're working with in terms of controls. We're going to start with the Contra test, and actually I found that this passes it pretty well. In fact, it did so well with the Contra test, I was a little bit worried about not being able to press diagonals at all. 
However, when playing the game itself, I had no problems actually getting any sort of diagonal movement. And the other thing I like to test when it comes to diagonals is when I want to do intentional diagonals. So for example here, I'm loading up a Capcom fighting game, and as you can see, I have absolutely no problem doing either Hadoukens or Shoryukens. So somehow, whatever company that made this M17 device actually got the D-pad right, in the fact that it passes both my Contra and Street Fighter tests. And even though I would prefer to have the D-pad up top, I didn't find this to be terribly uncomfortable when I was actually playing games. But of course, because I'm approaching this handheld like it's going to be for a child, I did want to do a more real-world test. So here's my 7-year-old trying out Sonic the Hedgehog 2. And I didn't say anything to him other than, hey, play this game, and he naturally went and tried to use the analog stick first. Bear in mind that my kids play a lot of Nintendo Switch, so they're very comfortable with this setup. After a couple minutes, I asked him, hey, would you rather use the D-pad or the analog stick? And his reply was, oh yeah, I should probably use the D-pad, and he started using that. And after he was using that for a couple minutes, I asked him how it felt, if it was uncomfortable, or he would rather use the analog stick or the D-pad. And of course, this is just a one-person sample, but he said, you know what, Dad, I don't really care either way, it's fine. And there are a couple things going for this handheld within the settings. For example, the analog stick is already mapped to the D-pad. So no matter what game they try, the child will be able to play it with either an analog stick or a D-pad no problem. Now even though I think this handheld is probably going to be designed for a more pick up and play experience, I did want to do a little bit of digging in the back end to see what we're working with. And when I put in the micro SD card, I did learn a few things. Number one, this card is actually formatted to XFAT. Usually they are formatted to FAT32. And the other thing I noticed is it's only one partition, so the firmware itself is not residing in the card. Instead, it's been flashed onto the 8 gigs of internal storage that this device has. And there's a couple things to this that are both good and bad. The good is the fact that the firmware is probably very stable, so if you were to flip off the switch at any random time while playing a game, I think because the firmware is flashed onto the internal storage, it's going to be less likely to get corrupted like it would be with an SD card. However, the bad component of that is that it's going to be hard for custom firmware developers to access that internal storage. So if anything, it'll be very similar to something like the Miu Mini, where the community itself doesn't have access to that storage, and instead they have to work with the file system and SD card to kind of make the tweaks as they go. And the good thing here is that the cores and the configurations are actually stored on the SD card as far as I can tell. And that means that if a developer does want to try to customize the experience, they do have full access to the configuration and RetroArch cores. Now personally, I'm not a developer, so I don't know my way around all of this stuff, but I did try to make some configuration changes myself. For example, I tried to swap out a couple buttons, things like that, and unfortunately, even when changing them in the RetroArch configuration file, it didn't actually stick. So I do think it will require some digging from the community developers. However, the one thing that I think users will be able to very easily do is adjust the game library itself. For example, you remember I mentioned that there's about 4,000 NES games. You can find them within the ROMs folder right here. And so what I would do is recommend cleaning this up. For example, they have both zip files and NES files, so that's why we're probably getting some of these duplicates. Now for me personally, I'm just going to kind of do the nuclear approach, and I'm going to delete all of the game files within here that I don't want to use, and then I'm going to move over my own ROMs from my own internal library. But as you can imagine, it's a pretty drag and drop experience. Additionally, one of the benefits of having Emulek as the backend system is the fact that we can also add box art. Now video doesn't seem to be working, but box art does. And I've got an old video guide about offline scraping where you can basically scrape your entire SD card and put all your box art directly on it. So I'll leave that link down below, but just bear in mind it's a couple years old so the production quality is not quite as crisp. Either way, I've gone ahead and moved over all my files, and so now this is what we're working with with a curated library of retro games. And as I scroll through the games list, you can see that I've added all the box art, all the game names look nice and pretty. So this is really going to enhance the experience if you plan on personalizing this and maybe gifting it for someone else. And like I mentioned, you know, the process of booting up a game is exceptionally simple. So I think really anyone can figure it out, even somebody who's very young or maybe even very old. It's really just a matter of pushing the A button to launch a game. And of course, once you're done playing, all you have to do is press select and start. You'll get that quick menu and then you can go ahead and quit the game. And that's really about it. It's a very simple process to get in and out of your games, and you have the ability to both use in-game saves or save states. So I do think it's going to be simple enough for basically anybody to be able to navigate. Now I want to do some game testing to give you an idea of what you can expect in terms of performance, and what the overall experience is going to be like. 
The first thing you're going to notice right off the bat is that all of these systems have been stretched to full screen. So even something like Game Boy, which traditionally has a more square aspect ratio, is going to be all the way to 16 by 9. Now for me personally, this aspect ratio kind of hurts my heart, but that's also one of the reasons why I think it'd be just fine for kids. It's not like when I handed this device to my child, he said, oh man, this is just the wrong aspect ratio, dad. So in that regard, I'm not really letting it bother me that much just because I don't think that I'm the target audience for this particular setup. The way I've been thinking about it is that if I had to play games like this, it would kind of ruin my childhood experience. But if I was to give it to a child right now, it wouldn't ruin theirs. And like I mentioned before, there's a lot of potential for custom firmware. And so if somebody is able to get their hands on this and actually start working on it, I do think that things like aspect ratio will be an easy fix. Anyway, for these lightweight handheld systems, you know, Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Gear, yeah, all these games play absolutely fine. They're just a little bit stretched. Now, one system that actually looks pretty darn good with a wider aspect ratio is Game Boy Advance because this one was a little bit wider natively. So in that regard, if you want a fairly budget handheld that has a pretty easy access to Game Boy Advance, this might be a pretty good fit. However, one thing I did want to mention is it doesn't seem like they've optimized the Game Boy Advance emulator on this machine. For example, with some of the more heavyweight Game Boy Advance games like Final Fantasy VI Advance, I found we had some audio banding issues where it kind of had a warble and the speed would go up and down. Let me give you a quick listen, but fair warning, it's going to be pretty terrible. Now there was a little bit of slowdown as well when playing a game, but it was very minimal. I had to try really hard to even to notice it. It's really just the audio that kind of threw me off. So if anything, I would say when playing certain Game Boy Advance games, it might be in your best interest to turn the volume down. Anyway, let's go ahead and move on. I showed a couple NES games already, but I did want to confirm that yes, all the NES games in the catalog played just fine. And I also found that Sega Genesis played great. However, this also brought to light one other issue that I found. And that is within the configuration, they have swapped the X and Y inputs from what you would expect within Retroarch. So for example, when playing Sega Genesis, you would think that the A button would be the X button here on the machine, but it's actually the Y button or the top one among all the face buttons. So it is kind of odd to go all the way up to the top to press the A button while B and C are actually where you would think they would be. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to figure out how to make that change within Retroarch. And actually for all the other systems that we'll be testing that do make use of the X and Y button, I found it was the exact same thing. So unfortunately, whoever hacked up this version of Emulek messed up the X and Y mapping. And depending on the game that you're playing, that might feel pretty unnatural. The other thing I noticed is that they are applying a bilinear filter to all of these games. That means it will balance out the pixels and given the fact that we have a low resolution screen, that's not a bad thing at all. But it does also mean that it will soften that image. And when you combine that with the fact that we don't have an OCA laminated screen, it does feel pretty darn soft. But on the bright side, it gives a very retro and 90s feel when you're actually playing. So if you're in the market for that kind of vibe, then yeah, this will actually work. One other thing of note about the Super Nintendo emulator, it does look like they're using a pretty old emulation core. And I did find there were some accuracy issues here and there, for example, with Super Mario World Yoshi's Island. Now, in terms of performance, Super Nintendo was pretty good. I got a little bit of slowdown with Yoshi's Island and Star Fox, but altogether, I would still say it's mostly playable. It's really going to be just that really top tier of games that might have a little bit of slowdown here and there. And again, not to beat a dead horse, but if we get some sort of custom firmware options, I think that this can be optimized very easily. Now, the one system where I didn't actually delete them out were the arcade games, because there are thousands of them here, and it's actually pretty well organized. And because arcade compatibility can be so wonky depending on the core and I'm not even sure what emulation core they're using, I decided to just keep them all in there and play them as is. And the nice thing here is that all of these games actually booted up just fine. So whatever arcade setup they have at least right now on the default card, it actually works pretty well. And thankfully there's not a ton of duplicates either. So if you are looking to play classic arcade systems, this is actually not a bad gig. But just bear in mind there's a lot of games in here, so you may have to spend some time navigating through to find the game you want to play. All right, next up we have PlayStation 1, and I really only have a couple notes about it. Number one, obviously, this is going to be stretched to 16 by 9, and I also found that CHD files did not boot within this default firmware. So I ended up using BinQ files, and then it worked fine from there. And for the most part, most PlayStation 1 games played just fine out of the box. But it was kind of like Super Nintendo in the regard that the very top tier of games, you know, like a top 2%, they did have a little bit of slowdown. Bloody Roar 2 is a great example. This one was still what I would consider to be playable, but it was a bit stuttery here and there. 
Now within their marketing materials and the file system, they do have other systems like Nintendo 64 and PlayStation Portable. But I'm here to tell you right now that I could not find any games on any of those systems that I would consider to be playable. For example, Super Mario 64 is a relatively lightweight game when it comes to a Nintendo 64 emulation, and this one was noticeably not playing at a full speed. And of course, the further you progress with the games that are harder to emulate, it just got even worse. So something like F-Zero X, which I would consider to be a mid-tier Nintendo 64 game, was basically impossible to play at full speed. And it's a very similar story with PlayStation Portable. I started out by trying to play puzzle games. I figured at least these would be playable. And it does look like they're using the standalone version of PPSSPP. However, again, I was not able to actually get into the menu, but it does feel like they've enabled a frame skip within here. So even though the most lightweight puzzle games like Luminous and Busta Move Deluxe were kind of playable, it wasn't a great experience because of that frame rate. Another thing worth noting is they have the French language enabled for the PlayStation Portable settings. And so if there are any games that do support multi-languages, you'll be playing these games in French instead of English. But like I said, because of all the slowdown and frame skipping that's going on, at least with this version of PSP, it may not be worth it either way. So with all those things considered, I did make an emulation report card. A couple things worth noting is we don't have any colorization options within Game Boy right now, so all the games are going to play in black and white. I also gave Game Boy Advance, Super Nintendo, and PlayStation 1 a yellow coloring, and that's for all the issues that I mentioned in these segments before. I do think these systems are still playable, but you do have to exercise some caution in the fact that it's not going to be perfect. And of course, like I just showed, you know, Nintendo 64 and PSP, at least right now, I wouldn't consider to be playable at all. And finally, before we start wrapping up, one other thing I did want to make note of is that you can change out the themes if you'd like. And this is a very simple process. All I did is went to the Emulet GitHub, and then I downloaded a bunch of themes, and then I found the themes folder within the SD card, and then I pasted it within there. From there, all I had to do was just change the name of the theme folder to M17. That'll basically turn it into the default theme. And as you can see, this one right here called Retrofix actually worked pretty well. And so again, I think this is just another testament of how this device has a lot of potential when it comes to community support. And so with all that taken into consideration, let's go ahead and start wrapping up and talk about what I like and what I don't like about the M17 handheld. As always, we'll start with what I like. And number one, this thing is sturdy as heck. This is the kind of device that I feel like I could give to a kindergartner and I wouldn't be too worried about them breaking it. I also appreciate the fact that it has a very simple interface. I think that basically anybody who can read is going to be able to go through and navigate through these games. I also like the fact that it is somewhat customizable. For example, the ability to change out the theme. And you can also add your own games, add your box art, things like that. Additionally, like I've mentioned quite a few times now, this has a lot of custom firmware potential. I almost feel like this is kind of like the original Mio Mini in the fact that we have a device that actually gets a lot of things right, and with a little bit of intervention, we could even make this something that would be a lot of fun to use. Part of that has to do with the fact that we have some pretty decent controls, and the fact that we have a physical on and off toggle, which I think is going to make it great for giving it as a gift. Now, of course, this thing is far from perfect, so let's talk about some of the things I didn't like about the M17. Number one is the screen. You know, it's not OCA laminated, and that's something that we've kind of come to expect in 2023. And I think that'll really come down to personal preferences, but I found that after using this for about a week, I didn't really mind that lack of OCA lamination. Instead, I just started treating it like a 90s console. In that regard, it was kind of charming. But of course, your mileage may vary depending on your own preferences. The other thing I didn't like was the placement and the size of the D-pad. I think that the outer parts of it are just a little bit too thin, and I do wish that the D-pad was above the left analogs. Now the next three things I'm going to asterisk because I think they will be easily fixed by custom firmware, but all the same I think we should review the device as is. Number one, I don't like the fact that we don't have any configuration options. I'd love to be able to adjust the aspect ratio to be core provided. Another thing that's annoying is the fact that the X and Y buttons are swapped. Depending on the system that you're playing, for example with Super Nintendo, that can be very unnatural feeling. Additionally, I found that PlayStation Portable and Nintendo 64, even though it is listed as a game system, was unfortunately unplayable. Now I don't have high hopes that these systems will be fully playable anytime in the future, but it would be nice if a couple 2D and puzzle games would actually work. So in the end, you're probably wondering whether or not I recommend the M17 as a handheld device. And I've got a lot of feelings about this one, but I think the number one thing is whether or not you want to play it for yourself or give it to others. For me personally, this isn't a device I would probably play very often, especially considering the fact that I have many other options to choose from. 
However, when it comes to just a plug and play experience, you don't get many options like this right out of the box that are gonna be this good. At this price point, you will often find devices that have some very fundamental issues like screen tearing. And on the M17, that's not a problem at all. Instead, it's really just a matter of configuration and the fact that the screen is not laminated. So in the end, the way I see it is that yes, I recommend this if you do plan on giving it to somebody who's kind of a non-gamer but still wants to play some of these old games. I think that if you don't mind sitting down and kind of curating the game list and the box art, it would be a great gift for both your parents and maybe your children. However, considering the stock experience, I'm not really sure this is going to be a great fit for you who's actually watching this video. If you're tech savvy enough to be able to look up this device on YouTube and watch a video about it and even understand some of the emulation things I'm talking about, then I do think there are better options at around this price point. For example, something like the Mio Mini Plus or the Ambernic RG35XX. So on one hand, yes, this is a device I can recommend as a gift, but on the other hand, it's kind of a wait and see device. This is one of those handhelds where I want to check in a few months from now and see whether or not the community has picked it up because it does have a lot of potential and I really enjoyed testing and reviewing this device. Anyway, let me know what you think in the comments down below. Is this e-waste or do you see the potential in it as well? As always, thank you for watching and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.